macular degeneration since childhood. She set numerous Paralympic records on the track, and her success now in open competition has been a source of pride to those Paralympic athletes who are dedicated and determined at their events. She has spent most of her life visually impaired. It's something she's lived with, even thrived with, an inspiration to all. Laser burning, lungs are max, heart rate max, you still have 600 meters to go. And when I get to that point, I pretty much say, well, you're there, Marla. You're in, you're in it now, so I will just put this race away. Because I felt that I was far more sighted than I was blind. I have ever spoken before. So thank you for being here. Um, it helps me to know, since I look out at all of you, and I'm not really able to see all of you, but um, by the way, you all look fabulous today. Um, I, I want to hear by applause, and you can cheer if you want. Um, undergraduate students here today, how many of you? students here today. Okay, undergrads are out, outnumbering you. Um, staff, teachers, professors, <laughs> and I hear we also have high school students. Here is Okay. Any, any, anyone else I've heard of? <laughs> others, the other, others that I have not categorized. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming. Um, I'm incredibly nervous, as I said, you're the largest audience I've ever had the opportunity to speak to, but I think it'll be fine. Um, I, I want to ask athletes, student athletes here today, runners, okay, some of you. So runners, we're, a, we're an odd group, okay, because we're the only people who put fun and running in the same sentence. And most people think that that's really unusual. Um, I'm going to talk to you, you know, we're here to celebrate diversity today and talk about accessibility and I'm going to get to those topics later on. But I have to first talk to you about running, um, which is so close to my heart. And as you saw in the video, um, for most of my running career I was a track runner. And um, people say, well, you know, how do you run? How do you know where you're going? How is it you don't fall down? How do you see where you're going and he's like, well, it's pretty simple. You know, I have enough peripheral vision that I can see the ground beneath my feet, you know, within, I don't know, five, 10 feet or so. You know, when it gets beyond 20 feet, I don't quite know what's ahead of me, but I say I'll figure it out when I get there. And the track is oval. So you get out there and you just turn left. <laughs> you know, you turn left, you run straight, you turn left run straight for a little bit and turn left again, and you just do that. And if you're leading the race, there's nothing in front of you to run into. So, so that has sort of been a strategy, is, is I found the track to be a very simple environment in which to run, because um, I, I run without any hesitation or fear. Um, obviously, to compete at the highest level, you have to be that courageous. Um, so track running was, the, the majority of my running career. But in 2002, I decided I wanted to run my first marathon. And um, some people think that's crazy. But um, anyone want to guess which marathon I chose? You know, we have here in the US, we have Chicago, we have Boston, we have LA, we also have? There you go. 
So New York City 2002 was my first marathon um, de and debut, excuse me, and my, my first choice. Now, um, New York City Marathon is by far the most high energy, motivating, um, inspiring race I feel there is, marathon course in the US. It's also a very challenging course. Um, I think the pavement is harder in New York. Um, and my quads will testify to that. Um, it's not a fast course, because it's got some rolling hills in it, but it's definitely the place to run. Um, I started training for the marathon, you know, four months out after finishing up a track season, and um, I do like, you know, 22 to 24 miles on Sundays. I did, I still kept up some track sessions to keep up my speed. I did interval train. I did a long interval training and tempo runs and all that. My husband at the time was coaching me, and uh, we thought we had thought of everything to get ready for this marathon. Um, and so we put in a video of a previous New York City marathon, part of my preparation. I sat up really close to the TV so I could see it, and um, I noticed something, and that was I watched this elite group of runners. Um, run by a table with about 50 different water bottles, each runner grabbing their very own personal bottle um, with some, you know, special concoction of, you know, fluids for um, hydration. And they would grab that bottle and uh, keep on running with, without even missing a stride, no hesitation. And I looked at my husband and I said, how am I going to see my water bottle? It was the one thing we hadn't thought of. Well, I ended up calling um, a race coordinator for New York City Marathon, a man by the name of David Monty. I said, David, I don't, I, my training is going well, but I don't know how I'm going to find my water bottle. He said, don't worry, Marla, we're going to figure it out. It'll be fine. Well, David's solution was um, he found a very nice woman to volunteer to ride a bike to each water station, which was every four miles, get off the bike, stand behind my bottle, and do this. Marla, over here, come over here, it's over here, it's over here, it's over here, over here. <laughs> so, at four miles, I hear, Marla, it's over here, it's over here, Marla, 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 over here. And then eight miles, same thing. 12 miles, 16 miles, 20 miles, 20 miles, I just said, I'm good. I don't need it. I'll be fine. I just want to finish the race. But that was amazing. We're here today to talk about accessibility and what an, what an amazing accommodation they made for me to run that marathon was to, make, was to find a way to make sure I could find my water bottle. Well, in New York City, you finish the marathon in Central Park. And, um, you enter the park for a brief time, you actually exit it with a mile to go, and just because it's New York, that last mile, uphill. So I take that turn, Central Park South, got a gradual uphill, right-hand turn at Columbus Circle, and then you're about 600 meters to the finish. And even though I can't see it, I know it's coming, I know it's there. And as I finally approach that finish line, I have to tell you that to this day, it is by far the greatest vision I've ever had in my life. I crossed the line. My husband was there to catch me. And I said two things. I said, what place did I get? And where's the bathroom? <laughs> now I ran in the elite women's field. I ran against women from Kenya, Ethiopia, Russia. Um, when, you know, when I saw the entry list of competitors, I thought, Marla, what are you thinking? My goal had been to finish in the top 10. I found out after I finished the race that I, in fact, finished fourth. I was the first American finisher to cross the line, first American female finisher, and I had run a time of two hours, 27 minutes, and 10 seconds. Now that corresponds to about an average pace per mile of about five minutes, 37 seconds. I also learned after the fact that my fastest mile of the race was mile 25. 
And you all know that that's because I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> in any case, um, while I've run in the Olympics, and I've run so many races throughout my lifetime, um, that race in particular is one of the most memorable, and I wanted to share that with you. Um, as you know, I, I have a vision impairment. I'm legally blind by definition. And I'll share with you kind of my story, my journey of how that all happened. Most people don't know that I was actually born with normal eyesight. And I grew up in Southern California playing with my older brother, actually trying to run away from my older brother. Um, we are a pretty outdoorsy family, active all the time. And there was really no indication that there was anything wrong with my vision until the day I entered the fourth grade and walked into my classroom. I sat at my desk and the teacher started to write probably her name on the chalkboard. And I looked up and I couldn't see what she was writing. And I thought, what's wrong with her chalk? It, it never occurred to me that there was something wrong with my eyes. Well, I eventually started to cry because I felt like I was missing out on what was going on. And my teacher took me outside and said, what's wrong? And I told her, I can't see the board. And that was the beginning. My teacher would call my parents, and of course the solution seemed so simple. She needs glasses. So we began a, probably a two-year journey of optometrist to optometrist to ophthalmologist to retina specialist, and finally arriving at the diagnosis of microdegeneration. Meanwhile, I struggled in school. My teacher would write down some of the things on the board with big black markers so I could see them. Um, I couldn't see my books. <coughs> But my mom would track down magnifying glasses and other visual aids to help me get by. But my overall perception of my vision at that time as a child was, it's no big deal. I can, mom, I can do it. It's no big deal. And I even remember the day my mom told me the word, legally blind. She said, Marla, the doctors say that you're legally blind. I said, no, I'm not. And because my own perception of my vision impairment was, it's no big deal. I'm going to figure this out. I wasn't afraid to try anything. And as you could, might say, denial, in a sense, worked well for me. And so I did try just about everything, going out for track, um, wanting to go to college, wanting to be in sports. Um, although, you should have seen my mom's face when I said I want to drive. <laughs> there wasn't anything I didn't want to try, and there wasn't anything I, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to do. But what I noticed when I was diagnosed with a disability is that before that, the sky was the limit. My parents expected a lot from me, my teachers expected a lot from me. But the moment that diagnosis came, it was like a ceiling came down right here. And I had to go like this. It was like, Marla, just do the best you can. That's what I heard a lot. The doctors think you won't be able to do well in school, so just do the best you can. The doctors think you may not be able to do sports anymore, so just do the best you can. Well, if anyone knows me, they know that if you want me to do something, just tell me I can't do it, because I'm going to turn around and show you I can. And I had to break through that glass ceiling of expectation, that lowered expectation, and I decided I would expect more from myself than what others expected from me. And I set out through my lifetime with that same attitude. It's no big deal. I can do it. I'll figure it out. I think perception of your disability, and, and I say that generalized, because I think we all, some of us have physical disabilities, some of us have learning disabilities, 
We all have things we're not strong at. We all have skills that are, we're good at, we have things we're good at, we have weaknesses. So we all have our own little set of disabilities. But I think what is most important is not your weakness, but how you perceive it. I could have just as easily said, I can't do that, I'm blind. I could have shut it down, sat on the couch, called it a day. As we know, your attitude and your own perceptions of what you believe is possible is so much more important than your disability. My mom would say to me, Marla, there is, what did she say? She said, Marla, you can't choose what happens to you in life, but you can choose how to respond. And those words, when she first told me, didn't mean as much to me as they do now. So we all have choices. We don't have control of everything that happens to us, but we have choices on how to respond. As I moved into adulthood, my life became kind of a journey of realizing that yes, in fact, because of my blindness, there are things I just simply can't do. And I had to make a choice. Do I dwell on my limitations or do I focus on my strengths? Which do you think I chose? I chose to focus on my strengths because dwelling on what I couldn't do, dwelling on what I couldn't see, was never going to get me anywhere. Um, I wanted others to see me as just Marla. I wanted people to perceive me, not my disability. So I think I have a job to do. We all kind of have a job to do. And that is make the qualities of ourselves that we want others to know about us more visible than our disability. So when someone meets me for the first time, what do I want them to know about me? I want them to know I'm intelligent, I want them to know I'm caring, and I'm kind, and I'm understanding. I want them to see me as an athlete, as a teacher, as a mother. I want them to know that I value perseverance, determination, and integrity. This is what I want you to know about me. I never wanted to be known as the blind runner. I never wanted a spectator to look down on the track and say, she runs pretty fast for a blind girl. I wanted them to say, wow, she runs fast. So if I want to be seen for who I am and for my strengths, then I have to make them more visible to you. So that's what you see. So think to yourself right now, when people meet you, what, what's the first thing? How do they see you? How do they see you? What do you want them to see? How can you make those qualities in yourself more visible? My other perception of my blindness is that it has given me many gifts. It has taught me how to be incredibly persevering. In fact, pretty darn stubborn, to be honest. Very determined. And since it happened to me as a child, I think it contributed to the adult I am today. Would I have been an Olympic athlete if I did not have the values of perseverance and determination and the I can do it attitude? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know who I would be today if it weren't for the gifts that my blindness has given me. And if someone were to say, Marla, they can cure you. They're, they're, they can now fix your vision and you can see, 2020. Wow, what, a, what an amazing, miraculous thing that would be. And I'm not saying I would, I would turn it down entirely, but I would, I would take a pause because I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there without first an incredible amount of consideration and gratitude for what this condition has taught me and for the person it has made me become.
We're here today to excuse me, celebrate and talk about embracing a culture of accessibility. And we all probably, if we think about it, have a different meaning for what that, what that really is. So I'm going to share with you what I think that is to me. Well, first of all, if we're talking about accessibility, we have to think about separating the difference between I can't do that and I can't access that. There's a difference. So for example, as a college student who's visually impaired or blind, and I find out from my professor that I've got to read chapters 1 through 20 by next week in a textbook with 12-point font, um, well, it's not that I can't read, and it's not that I can't understand the information. It's that I can't access it. So those of us in the field of education have to really start thinking about learning and how we learn. How can we make that information accessible to someone who may not be able to see it or hear it or access it? So think about that. For those of you who are going into education and you have your student, your classroom of students, is it that they can't do it or is it that they can't access it? I think we all learn differently, and I don't believe that we all learn by sitting in a room at a table with four walls. We all learn differently. Some of us learn better in the real world. So we consider those differences in how we teach our students. I think the other thing we have to think about when we talk about embracing a culture of accessibility is our environment. And this is the most obvious, right? When we think of accessibility, we think, wheelchair ramps for every building. We might remember, oh, there's braille numbers on those elevators, right? I don't know if you have them here, but in Eugene, we have at the crosswalks. You hit the, the crosswalk button, and it actually will tell you when it's safe to cross. These are all fantastic innovations to make our environment accessible. But it's not enough, because it doesn't address culture. It's just the environment. I found a definition of culture in one of my textbooks recently, and it said, a blueprint for how individuals think, feel, and behave in society. A blueprint. Can we change a blueprint? I think we can. So the number one variable to embracing a culture of accessibility, to me, is our perceptions of each other our expectations of each other. Because our perceptions and expectations of each other will influence how we treat each other. So those are the very, those are the factors I think. If we want to leave this room today and start creating and creating an environment of accessibility for all people, let's think about that. Perceptions, environment, and accessibility. Um, I want to give each of you a job to do. It is school, you know. You have homework. All right? So this is what I want you to do. Sometime today or tomorrow, I want you to find a person that you normally or ordinarily would not talk to. Someone who might look different than you. Someone it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a disability or not. But just a different person that you don't know. I want you to find this person. I want you to walk up to them. I want you to smile and look at them and, and introduce yourself and learn something about them. Because even though we're here today to talk about diversity, when we actually take down all these invisible walls and talk to each other, we discover something. We're really not that different. We're really not. And I know we can find a common ground. I know we can find something that we share in common. And so that's your job. That's your homework. You can email me and let me know how it turns out. All right. So my life, all I've seen is what's possible. I see the possibility. And a lot of that is shaped by my own perceptions of my vision impairment. 
my vision for how our society could be, maybe should be. I see a possibility. Can we change our blueprint? Can we change how we think, how we perceive, and how we interact? I think we can. I think we can. So thank you for having me at this amazing event. Thank you for coming, first of all. And I want to set aside some time now if anyone would like to ask a question. So um, again, thank you all for, for coming. And, and um, let me know how your homework assignment turns out. <laughs> thank you. you guys questions in the past, but maybe someone can help me out with that and how we want to do it. There will be a wireless microphone in the middle of the room. Please step up to the microphone and direct to your question. Mexico and Spain and Germany 
Um, and of course, I know I've recently learned about Lauren's work, Lauren Lieberman's work with Camp Abilities. I think the message is coming. Um, whether or not it reaches the right people, the people who can change the laws, and the people who can say, this is the way our society is going to be, this is going to be the law, until that happens, we're, we're going to hit some barriers. Um, we are blessed in this country with the laws that have happened so far to create accessibility for all people. And, and I think we're leading the way in that respect. So I think it will happen. Thank you so much. and a very interesting dynamic because, as mentioned in the introduction, I had experiences I, I had experiences at both the Paralympics and the Olympics, um, which, is, which is really amazing to, to have had both of those experiences. Um, I think when I am pretty much in the sighted world and I'm the only one with a vision impairment, people are puzzled. They see me run or they see me walk down the lobby of a hotel and they don't really know what I can and cannot see. And there's a lot of misunderstandings that can happen. Um, and it's hard because I can't recognize people at all very well. I, I mean, I've come up to a complete stranger in the grocery store and thought it was my husband and held his hand. So, <laughs> so that, was not, that was not a good moment. Um, so, since I can't recognize people, but I see people, it's not like I'm going to run into them, but I see that there's someone there and I'm not able to tell you who it is, um, that's, very pro that's a huge social barrier. Talking about accessibility, that is such a huge barrier to overcome for someone with a vision impairment, and it impacts our social interactions tremendously. Because then it's like I walk by someone I know, a really good friend, I don't say hello, they're like, what's her problem? Man, she's so stuck. What's her deal? So there's there's a lot of that misunderstanding, and um, I think the elite athlete community they all knew because it was in the media, so they all knew of my vision, but they didn't really understand it, and nobody really came up to ask me about it. But um, I developed some great friendships in the international world of running um, that I still have to this day, and. Uh, um, people from other countries, runners from other countries coming up to, to say how happy they were to meet me. So, um, excellent question. I, I can't give you the, the precise answer since I don't know what other people were thinking. All I can tell you is that when it came time to run and the gun went off, there were no, there's no generosity. It's, it's all elbows and spikes and, and everyone wants to win. Thank you for uh, coming here, and uh, I was just wanting to ask you, it's such a huge stretch going from the 800 to the marathon, I think that's amazing for anyone, uh, especially at the elite level. And I was just wondering, uh, who was your support team? Uh, was it your uh, husband, um, some good coaches, friends? Um, but I, ha I had a, um, when I was running in San Diego, my training was more sprint, and I was trying to be more of a, I actually tried the heptathlon. Um, and I ended up, le and I was, and my best event was the 800. And then I ended up leaving San Diego and moving to Eugene, Oregon. And I kind of felt like when I moved to Oregon, I sort of discovered a whole new perspective on running and how to actually train the right way, or how to um, not just go out to the track and kill yourself every day but to actually train um, for, a, for a given performance and train all the different physiological systems and all of that. So it's aerobic and anaerobic training combined. And I think um, 
yes, I had many good coaches through my career. I had, I had, um, I changed coaches a few times. So it wasn't until the end of my career that my husband was coaching me. Um, but the other thing is, the amazing thing you need for support as an athlete, you need um, a chiropractor. Because <laughs> I'll tell you right now that he was, he was the one who kept me on my feet. And um, it is a team. I mean, it's like you get out, I'm the only, when I go to race, I'm the only one on the track. But really, there's about half a dozen people that got me there. So I never forget that. And um, you need that much for support believe me, to, to get out there and run and run at the, at the highest level. So um, I just had a very small team of people. I had my coach, my manager, my chiropractor, and a massage therapist, and that was, that was what I needed. So um, very thankful for the people that, that came into my life to, to make my accomplishments possible. All my students were hearing impaired or deaf um, and had some other disabilities, whether it was orthopedic or vision. And um, the primary mode of instruction was American Sign Language. And, um, and so that was kind of where the direction I was going. Um, um, I have had friends with, that are deaf blind and I can sign into their hands for communication. Um, and so I think that was sort of my inspiration to go into that field. Um, and um, most recently, I I've worked in a lot of different areas in education. Um, I've served kids, you know, ages five to 21. Most recently, working in a life skills program in our, my own community. Um, I actually serve as a communication disorder specialist. So I come in and I work with a lot of kids with autism, um, Down syndrome. Um, orthopedic disabilities, all variety of things, and my goal is to try to create a system for them so they can communicate what they want, communicate anything, so that they can just communicate and access their education. Um, um, every single student is different. There, there just isn't one way to go about any of it, and I always think that I take a look at each individual student and really lay out his strengths and how we can use those strengths to build the most meaningful system for him. So um, I'm very leery of anything that comes in a box and they say this is the curriculum you need to use for your, your students in special ed because I think every student is so different. We have to individualize their education. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but, um, but I have worked with a lot of different kids with a lot of different challenges. Marla, that may be a fine way to end it as we think about individual differences as we teach and learn. I'm going to use a presidential prerogative and ask you a question, put the pressure on you here too. But, you know, I was thinking about your, the water bottle story and cheering and getting that to you. Just think of the technology that could be applied to that these days. But my question is a, a little more personal when I was, I was talking to Lauren a moment ago. You've talked about your husband and his role in your life. Um, you now live in the premier running community, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I know you have a daughter, Anna Lee. Is she following in your footsteps in terms of running? And perhaps more importantly, does she um, think about you at the age of nine and whether this may be um, hereditary? And I don't know if that, if, if uh, Stengar's disease is or not, but if you would comment on that, it's a very personal question. Um, so yes, I have a six-year-old daughter named Anna, and, um, and what was I gonna say about that? Um, she does not know me as a runner. In fact, one day when she was about three and a half, I was previewing a video of a race. I think it was actually the Olympics. I was watching me run in the Olympics on my computer, and she came in and she sat on my lap and she goes, "Mom, is that you?" I said, "Yeah." And she goes, oh, "Can I watch Dora?" <laughs> <laughs> so that pretty much tells you how much she cares about my running. Um, what's interesting, though, is 
watching her come to realize that mom sees differently. And, and um, when I went to her first parent conference in, in kindergarten, she said to the teacher, um, my mom can't drive because she has bad eyes and she'll smash into people. <laughs> so she has, you know, they just tell it how it is, don't they? Um, it's interesting to watch my daughter develop an understanding that of difference that I see differently. As we know, it's, that's perspective taking, which is which is something we acquire. And um, and so she she's still not able to, you know, she's still learning to read. And so she'll bring something home from school and hand it to me, and then she'll run and she'll go get my magnifying glass to me to read it. She goes, "Here, mom, so you can read it." So. Um, so that's pretty heartfelt. But then she, when she really wants someone to read, like you know, read one of her, she goes to dad, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, is it hereditary? It, Stargardt's disease is a recessive hereditary condition. So that meant that I inherited one recessive gene from each of my parents. So I have both. You have to have both to have the condition. So um, the only way my daughter will develop it is if. If my husband also has at least, you know, is also the carrier of it, and then it would be a 50-50 chance. And we never did any genetic testing, and we never even considered that. So um, I don't know. We just never, we never really worried about it too much. And I, and she sees fine, right? She sees way better than I do. That's for sure. I'm going to be asking her to read to me in the very near future.